one world or none. All men of goodwill earnestly hope that a realistic control of atomic weapons can and will be achieved. And while the prospect of a nuclear holocaust is certainly chilling, the actual mechanism of disarmament has completely eroded away sovereignty. First at the nation state level by undermining the right to self-defense and declare war and has sadly progressed to undermining individual rights, including that to keep and bear arms under the United States Constitution. In 1959 and 1960, the United States took part in the United Nations 10 Nation Committee on Disarmament. It took on issues of international nuclear, chemical and biological weapons. While it wouldn't last, it would lead to the formation inside the United States of the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency under the 1961 Arms Control and Disarmament Act. The legislation had been pushed for by the skull and bones globalist John J. McCloy. It too promised not to interfere with, restrict, or prohibit the acquisition, possession, or use of firearms by individuals. And yet it was a long road and a tangled web. By 1963, the United Nations would achieve its partial test ban treaty. By 1968, the United States would fully enter into gun control legislation, passing the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act, and later the Gun Control Act of 1968, modeled by Senator Dodd on Nazi Germany's gun control legislation from 1938. The United Nations would continue its disarmament track, setting up in 1969 the Conference on the Committee on Disarmament, which would later form the more permanent body, the Conference on Disarmament, set up in 1979. In 1972, it would pass a Biological Weapons Convention. As you know, the genesis of this treaty uh, goes back a long time, for two decades. Uh, people have been campaigning on this issue. The United Nations was no longer content simply trying to disarm weapons of mass destruction. By the 80s and 90s, the United Nations began to take on conventional weapons. And in 1990, that included a treaty on conventional armed forces in Europe, followed by the beginnings of a register of conventional arms. Now, by 1993, Bill Clinton had passed the assault weapons ban inside the United States that would last 10 years. This weapon can be extended and put up to 60 to 9 rounds. The next year, in 1995, Bill Clinton turned towards international gun control. Clinton would speak at the 50th anniversary of the United Nations, using the platform to beat the drums to go after conventional and small arms as well, telling them they should turn their swords into plowshares and hope for world peace. We must work on conventional weapons from crime syndicates and drug cartels. Each barrier to justice brought down, each sword turned into a plowshare. That same year, Clinton would urge the United Nations to begin a study on small arms on December 1995. That report would be published two years later and would discuss openly in the header the complete and general disarmament of small arms weaponry. From that time forward, the United Nations would pass literally dozens of treaties and agreements, many of them dealing just in Africa, but all of them dealing with small arms, conventional weapons, parts for firearms, and even ammunition. The 2001 South African Development Community Protocol would not only take on so-called illicit trade of firearms, but would begin to curtail small arms ownership as well, creating a legal basis to deal with both legal and illegal firearms in South Africa. And by 2005, there would be an international tracing instrument set up and adopted generally at the United Nations level. From Bill Clinton in the 90s to President Calderon in Mexico in the years 2010 and 2009 to Hillary Clinton and Obama of the current administration, they have all blamed the quote illegal flow of weapons south as a tool to try to rein in the Second Amendment and create greater restrictions. The, I have never favored uh, all out ha uh, ban on handguns. And just really brainwash people into thinking about guns in a vastly different way. Try as hard as we can to keep guns away from people who shouldn't have them. Looking to Fast and Furious, we could see how talking points about stopping the illegal flow of weapons, keeping weapons from getting in the hands of drug cartels and other violent non-state actors, plays into the United Nations' larger attempt 
to rein in guns. Now, the United Nations knows they cannot directly target the United States' domestic ownership of firearms because of the Second Amendment. And so the Fast and Furious documents have shown how the Obama administration, Eric Holder's attorney general, and other people inside the ATF and related organizations all deliberately put guns into the hands of drug cartels in order to demonize the Second Amendment and put more bureaucratic red tape around arms dealers in the Southwest and redeploying 100 personnel to the southwest border in the next 45 days to fortify its Project Gunrunner, which is aimed at disrupting arms trafficking between the United States and Mexico, working with the Mexicans specifically to facilitate gun tracing uh, activity which targets uh, the illegal weapons uh, and their sources in the United States. We saw that directly with the new policy at the ATF telling the four southwestern border states, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California, that they would now have to do extra paperwork and report directly to the FBI whenever someone bought more than two semi-automatic weapons. Now, here at the present 2012 United Nations Arms Trade Treaty, we further see the Mexican delegation telling the other representatives of the world that the Second Amendment is no excuse for not having, quote, product controls on products traded across borders. That's using international bureaucratic legal lawyer speak to try to attack the Second Amendment covertly. The erosion of our Second Amendment is not going to happen overnight, but it is going to happen incrementally through different agreements over the decades, gradually drawing in the net. That's really what we have to watch out for here. And because the United Nations Treaty will explicitly say it doesn't go after the U.S. and other domestic nations' right to have arms, it will appear as though it's not infringing on that right. But nothing could be further from the truth. We must always be vigilant, always be on guard, and always say no to gun control, because that is submission to slavery. I'm Aaron Dykes for the InfoWars Nightly News. Have you been to InfoWarsShop.com lately? Express your inner patriot with these brand new InfoWars t-shirts. Say it loud with the InfoWars bullhorn shirt. Or educate the sheeple with the Bill of Rights shirt. Grope the public's mind with the TSA shirt. And with this shirt, you can let the dark side know of the Rebel Alliance's power. All available at InfoWarsShop.com sick of the globalist eugenicist control freaks adding poison to your water and laughing as you get sick and die start purifying your water with pro pure my friends i've done a lot of research and the best gravity filter out there bar none is pro pure and it's available discounted at infowars.com its filters are silver impregnated to prevent bacterial growth there's no priming required it's nsf 42 certified optional fluoride filters can reduce fluoride up to 95 percent easy to set up and use doesn't require electricity purify water from lakes streams ponds and wells this filter system leaves in beneficial minerals which is key save money by not buying bottled water and avoid bpa that leaches from the plastic pro pure is the best gravity fed filter out there it's what my family uses infowars.com already has the lowest price on pro pure but if you add the promo code water at checkout you get an additional 10 percent off at infowars.com you can also call to order 888-253-3139. And we are back. Thank you for joining us. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. Once again, I'm your host, Darren McBreen. And coming up next, we're going to take a look at an interview I had just a couple of months ago with Ed Haslam. He is the author of Dr. Mary's Monkey, How the Unsolved Murder of a Doctor a secret laboratory in New Orleans, and cancer-causing monkey viruses are linked to Lee Harvey Oswald, the JFK assassination, and emerging global epidemics. Now, this was an in-studio interview that we're about to premiere for the first time right here on our program, and it sheds light on a fascinating angle of the JFK assassination that links accused patsy Lee Harvey Oswald with covert cancer research conducted by the CIA in an attempt to basically weaponize the disease and kill 
Fidel Castro. At least that's their excuse for the dangerous and careless program that they conducted. Now, all of this takes place behind the scenes in New Orleans in the early 1960s. There's a cast of characters that includes, well, Oswald's mistress, Judy Very Baker, co-conspirator David Ferry, who first met Oswald in the Civil Air Patrol, and Dr. Mary Sherman. She is the physician, or was the physician at the Oshner Clinic, who was murdered in 1964 in a hidden laboratory in New Orleans. And I also want to mention an important reference video that coincides with the interview that you're about to see. Alex Jones originally interviewed Ed Haslam on the radio show, and much of what is not covered in this segment well, it can be seen on the Alex Jones radio show interview. Just search for the title, Weaponized Cancer Viruses Exposed, and I guess you can call it part one of a two-part interview with the author. Did inoculating millions of trusted school children with polio vaccines contaminated by monkey viruses trigger an epidemic of soft tissue cancers? Now, what you're about to learn is that what happened back in the early 1960s affects our world tremendously today. An interview with Ed Haslam on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, the first point is the book is ultimately a cold case investigation into the murder of Dr. Mary Sherman. Yeah. And that's what my initial focus was, and I really had no intention of going into the JFK thing. I, in fact, would have preferred to stay away from it, but that's where the story leads. I went to the library and I got the homicide report, the precinct report, the autopsy report, and all of the newspaper articles for the next two weeks in, involving it, okay? So that is the core set of documents that I present in this book. And when we analyze those documents, you'll see what's wrong with the picture of Mary Sherman's murder. The Metropolitan Crime Commission is very interestingly connected to this because the guy that um, was Judy's boss in this Me and Lee book, he becomes the executive director of the Metropolitan Crime Commission. And the Metropolitan Crime Commission is a faux government, uh, it's got an official sounding name, right? Um, <laughs> like something out of Batman, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's actually a private organization that um, gives themselves uh, some sort of stature in the community by worrying about crime. And um, turns out that Alton Oshner, who is a major character in my book, he had been president of the American Cancer Society and mm -hmm. sat on the board with uh, CIA founder Walt Bill Donovan. Uh, and um, he is the guy that orchestrates the um, television and radio coverage of Lee Harvey, Harvey Oswald in New Orleans. <laughs> I mean, Oshner is a, a big player, and he's the one that brings Judy into New Orleans for this bioweapons program. Yep, yep. And he's on the board of the Metropolitan Crime Commission. What about his connections to David Ferry? What, do we have proof that you know, Oshner and Ferry work together? Well, and, we, we do have um, Judy's statement, okay? Sure. okay? Now, she is brought to New Orleans at the invitation of Oshner. When she gets there, Oshner's out of town. Mm -hmm. They send in an ex-Marine to get a hold of her because she's there early and they don't want a loose cannon around the deck and this sure. ex-Marine is Lee Oswald. Within 24 hours, Lee Oswald introduces her to David Ferry and when it comes time to, and Lee takes Judy over to Ferry's apartment and when it's time for Judy to meet with Oshner when he's back in town, it is Lee that sets up the meeting. Sure. So right. Lee Oswald is in the middle of this whole thing as a um, coordinator and a logistical support p person. I mean, for example, at one point, Judy needs some more fetal calf serum. Um, 
for her cancer experiments. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't want her going over to the medical supply place getting that. They send Lee over. And so Lee is running equipment and supplies.